So far on Ventures in Wine Country. Covert Farms 2014 whites, including their first attempt at a late harvest, have been crushed, fermented, aged, blended, filtered, and bottled, and Jean and Derek are eagerly anticipating their release. The old buildings on the Black Swift property have gone through an amazing transformation, and almost two years after Rob assembled his team, they're finally only a few days away from the grand opening they've long been waiting for. And the Chardonnay at Painted Rock seems to be reflecting an exciting new balance in their vineyard, one that John Skinner is eager to share with critics and enthusiasts alike, as he returns from an extremely successful event for Canadian wine in London. With the Hatchet Black Swift nearly ready for opening day, Jesse and Jason are on the road in Vancouver, launching the wines that will accompany the new winery. This is the Broadway International Wine Shop, and both the Hatch wines and the story behind them are generating some buzz. That single vineyard, single approach, uh, focused wines where each expresses a different sort of plot. And that's what we like. We're a small shop as well, so we try to find small and unique as well. And we really connect people to stories. And these guys have a fantastic story. The response we've got from restaurateurs in Vancouver for the last few months and then, you know, specifically the response we got tonight has just been a really pleasant surprise. I'm very humbled and grateful for it. When I'm in there and I hear Jesse and I hear the winemaker talking about why they did it, what their approach was, why they chose that particular plot over another one, and how that expresses itself in the wine. Like people, that, that connects people to the story. And, and it really, like, there's a sea of wine out there. And when you walk into a shop, you're like, you just see a sea of labels. But what, what connects you to something is the story. And I think that's what these guys have. Really, it's the yield that makes the biggest difference. And I came out tonight and looking around, it's a little overwhelming to see that people are there to taste those wines, yeah. you know, and people are texting me and I, you know, I do peek at that Twitter stuff that goes on and people are appreciating it. You know, I'm seeing people wearing the shirts and it's just cool. It's a cool thing. Yeah. I'd be lying to if I said that, no, I, I didn't think it was gonna work out because I, I really know that people, uh, including myself and people of my generation, really crave something that's outside of the box that allows you to take the wine very seriously but have fun at the same time. We think we're doing a great job on the, the entry level price points we've hit so far, but you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesse isn't the only one on the sales and marketing circuit this spring. Lauren Skinner is also making the rounds to some of Vancouver's top independent wine shops on her first solo sales calls in her new role with the family business. At Liberty Wines on Granville Island, store owner Pierre takes a few minutes out of his busy delivery day to sample the 2014 Painted Rock Chardonnay. This one, so we're excited for the summer. It's nice and crisp and acidic. And for you, I guess for you, guess I'll for try a little bit with you. It's been a long day, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's new French stainless steel, and then 20% of everything goes through malolactic fermentation. I've been out doing some sales calls, stopped in to see a few of the people that run the different liquor stores, and we've actually got our new Chardonnay that we just released, so I've been bringing that around the city and letting people have a taste of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, really appreciate it, and I'll Thank see you soon. Thank okay. You. Bye, okay, nice right. to meet you, see you later. Every few weeks I try to get out and visit a couple people and, and major sales trips um, to restaurants and stuff, we try to do three times a year. It went really well. I mean, honestly, we've got perfect weather for, for the Chardonnay. It's a beautiful wine. It's light, it's crisp, it's got great acidity. It's uh, we've got some wonderful food on the property and it really shows well in the Chardonnay. So it went over really well with everyone. Made a couple sales, so it was, <laughs> it was exciting. At Covert Farms, Derek is back preparing for summer sales season in the wine shop, a venue that's unique in allowing a personal connection with his customers. But whether he's in the wine shop or on the road, his sales philosophy remains the same. When I'm actually doing sales calls, I think the, the biggest thing for me is to connect with the relationship I have with the client. You know, our style is, is, is that honesty and integrity where I talk to them about what's your wine list about, what are you guys interested in, what are you looking for? I find a lot of success in promoting the partners that I've worked with. So, you know, being part of the Oliver Suisse Winery Association, if somebody's looking for a Merlot or a Riesling or wines that we don't do per se, I will get a lot of cachet or, or advantage by saying, well, you might want to consider, you know, Vin Perdue's Pinot Gris or Fairview Cellar's Merlot because they're absolutely delicious. 
As vacation season begins once again, both urban liquor stores and Okanagan tasting rooms prepare for a couple of months of brisk business, and sales trips are put on hold until the fall. Summer has returned to the Okanagan once again. The return of summer means the Okanagan Valley's roads, golf courses, beaches, lakes, and of course wine shops are all once again teeming with tourists. But the hot spring weather that has put the 2015 grapes two to three weeks ahead of last year's schedule has also left the valley drier than last year. And a week of 40 degree temperatures at the end of June have led to this. More than 200 brush and forest fires are burning throughout British Columbia early this summer, blanketing much of the province in a thick haze. Thankfully, Mother Nature has helped finish what she started this week. At Covert Farms, it's not just the 2014 wines that have been aging over the last few months. Gene is checking in on the biodiversity experiment he buried last year, aimed at helping his vines thrive through 2015 and beyond. Rudolf Steiner is a, as a scientist and a philosopher and, and such came up with a restorative um, thinking on agriculture and how um, the farm, looking at the farm as a whole living entity and uh, focusing energies on cycling the nutrients in the, in the farm. Uh, it's the microorganisms that basically create the, um, the soluble nutrients that the plants can use. You can see here I've exposed the uh, first horn and uh, you can see there's a nice, uh, nice little growth on it. Still nice and hard, so it might be a little on the moist side actually, which is because uh, from what I understand, and this is my first time making this, it should just pop out. So looking at it, it looks a little wet still. Maybe not quite ready yet. You know, in uh, in northern climates such as ours, not a lot of activity happens in the soil when it's frozen. Now that things have warmed up, uh, things should be happening a lot faster. So what I think I'll do is I'll rebury this and leave the rest of the horns undisturbed and uh, go from there. As for the 2014s, Jean, Derek and Jeanette are tasting the fruits of their last few months of labor in an effort to ascertain whether the whites and rosé are ready for public release. No, so we're just tasting it today to see sort of where it's at and if it's getting it's close. Well, just to, you know, we kind of know from pre-bottling how the wine was. You know, shortly after bottling, you find it's just like, you know, it's just, it's like you got, you know, you got allergies, you're all stuffed up, you can't, you know, it's just the flavor profile and the nose is all, you know, constrained. And so, yeah, there just seems to be a, you know, there's a, and wine by wine and vintage by vintage, um, they take a certain amount of time to uh, open back up again. You know, we make a rosé that's actually doesn't show well right out of the, you know, off the uh, line, if you will. Usually they take six to eight months before they really pop. Yeah, we should have. And, um, and this is typical of our rosé. I mean, it's, you know, low tonnage fruit, you know, it has, it carries a fair amount of tannin. And, yeah, I mean, the, the, the 2012 was a great example. I mean, 
we made a lot more of the 2012 and it kind of ticked along the year we uh, released it and then the next year it just took off like it was just phenomenal like it just hit its stride and off it went so this is this is probably another one similar to the 2012 it's you know it just needs a little bit of time the Roussan has a really nice uh, like just a minerality to it that really adds like a, a bass note that really holds all the wine together yeah it's really nice and then so Viognier brings even like you know we were saying this one's getting you know lush but Viognier really fleshes it out and yeah, this one's come together quite nicely I love the integration yeah I know our 2014, especially the reds, um, really, really sh showing well. And, um, you know, the depth and depth of flavor and the character of the wines, um, it's really exciting. You know, I came into Cobert Farms Family Estate in the, you know, where we were releasing the 2009s and 2010s, and they were challenging vintages with some, some real stars, some amazing wines, and some, some wines that were, you know, I wasn't sure. Like, it's, it's hard to take that snapshot and know where they're going to go. And to see the maturity now of, of, of some of our wines from even that rough vintages come through and, and show some really delicious characters and some great ageability. I've yet to see a wine, you know, in the, in the red wine program come to a maturation where it was, it's, it's over the hill, as we'd say. So, you know, we're running on our 10th anniversary now. It's a Gene's 10th year being part of winemaking and the wines are, uh, they're showing that they have the distance. From wine stores to tasting rooms to wine club members' doorsteps, a newly released wine has a number of potential first destinations. For Painted Rock's 2014 Chardonnay, some of the first few bottles were sent out for review and are being opened this week by two of Canada's top wine critics. Oh my. So I stick my nose in here. And glorious tropical fruit aromas. It's fantastic. It's, um, what I love the most about it is how fresh and pristine the fruit on it is. The oak here is subtly in the background. It's not, um, it's, 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 it's a lovely um, fruit forward uh, Chardonnay. I think John has outdone himself this time. I've tasted this wine for the last uh, several vintages it's been made and it seems to get better and better as his vines get older as well. Uh, they've always had really good wines. They've done everything from day one correctly from planting the vineyards, even the winery itself is a work of art, and the wines are nothing short of being exactly the same way. As it's warmed up, um, oh, in the, the half an hour it's been in the glass, it's become uh, absolutely lush. It just broadens out in the mouth, fills out the mouth with flavors that don't want to quit. It, it really is. Uh, it really is one of the one of the, the finest Chardonnays in the Okanagan. And it's a it's a completely elegant wine. I love that it just keeps going. As I said, the length and the persistence on it, the nose, everything. It the nose and the and the palate are very harmonious. Harmonious. So they work very well together. What you smell is what you taste. It's just very pleasing wine. Outstanding. If positive reviews of one wine are good for the profile of the winery, positive reviews for dozens of wines are equally good for the region, especially when they're offered by one of the world's top wine writers in the world's biggest wine market. We are now two and a half months since our trip to London, where Canada went to show its stuff at Canada House. It was a terroir-led initiative. Um, we had nine terroir members, and lo and behold, two and a half months later, Last Tuesday, we just got our first review from Jancis Robinson. Jancis is, if not the most powerful person, maybe the second most powerful person in the world of wine. So to me, I think it's a watershed moment in Canadian and British Columbia wine. I don't think we as a community recognize it just yet. I, I told my, my community when we were there, I said, okay, the first call is a cold call, the second call is warm, so we need to go, we need to do this again. It always boils down to economics when you export, but there's certainly strong interest in BC wines over there, which is what people like John Skinner and Jack Murray have been saying for years, but we've got to sort out the logistics now. It's a pretty expensive uh, freight drop, but we're working on it, and Jesse came back very excited. Over the last few years, Okanagan wineries have also been collecting an increasing number of high-profile international awards. 
And while opinions on how truly they reflect the quality can be mixed, more awards overseas means more exposure, and more exposure means more sales. Yeah, it was a very interesting season for awards. It was all over the map. We didn't submit as much as we have in some years. Like, everybody pats themselves on their back around here about how great their wines are, and that's wonderful in BC, but if, if it's not seen on the world stage against other wines, then, then you know, you, do, you definitely need to, to show those, those accolades. And so this is the second year, I guess, that we've uh, we won silver medals at Decanter. We won for our Michetia again, which was great, and um, some of the whites. Really happy to see. I mean, we're a small winery, and to see ourselves do so well on the world stage, um, I, I can't be happier. First, get the reviews. Second, get in. I want to take those Jansa scores. <laughs> I want to. I want to go to Pro Wine, and I want to. I want to win some market share. There's a new trade agreement happening with Europe right now, and I don't know if a lot of people are paying attention. There won't be tariffs on these wines. So we shouldn't be chasing our tail all over the world. We should be getting into that market right now. It's, these are all just small little steps, but over time, you do this enough times and you get brand recognition and you start you know, making inroads into other markets. Mission Hill got a great review for their Pinot Noir last year. That means the world to all of us. And, and they're a great leader in the industry. Kudos to them. I'm, I'm really, really proud of their leadership. And, and we're just trying to, trying to back that up and, and get into these markets. They've been out there a bus and hump by themselves for a very long time. And it's, and it's about time that the rest of the industry stood up and said, hey, we're with you. Let's, let's go really carry a flag. Let's carry a BC flag. The San Francisco International Wine Competition is North America's largest and yielded some outstanding results for British Columbia wineries this year. Absolutely proud of our label. Paul Morstead, the artist, is an absolutely wonderful artist and people really gravitate towards him and his art. So we're really excited to enter our first label contest and prestigious San Francisco label awards, sent him down to San Francisco. Results came back, a couple of the frenzies won some nice uh, awards, hatch line completely shut out. So I emailed the people who were in charge of the award ceremony down there, and sort of asked me if they had some feedback. So, uh, the judges themselves, she heard them say a few times over, I don't get it, which annoyed me at first and then made me laugh that much harder because I am picturing these fancy art judges looking at you know, these beautiful labels, I don't get it because there's really not that much to get. There are beautiful labels on cool looking wine bottles. And so we sort of joked that we're the uh, unanimous winner of the first annual I Don't Get It Award. And I'm sure that's an award we'll be winning numerous times over and over as we progress through this project. Over the winter, a number of new changes were made to BC's liquor laws, including new legislation that will allow grocery stores to sell wine. On the surface, many of the changes appear to be making more products available to more consumers. But as with many recent changes to the industry, the decision and how it's being executed are drawing mixed reviews and some concern from smaller producers. We're, we are now entering a new phase where we will have some grocery stores carrying BQA products, so that would be British Columbia specific products um, in their store settings. It's not done a lot to seem, seemingly help small retail producers, which were, or hospitality, so our restaurant and bar partners haven't gotten any breaks in this new legislation change. You know, the BC Wine uh, Authority and Institute and, you know, the government all having their little spats about how and where and what's going to happen and what pricing is. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Um, well, I knew, you know, that would probably be well received by the public. I mean, it seems kind of ironic that this is sort of happening at this stage right now. I mean, rural BC has had, you know, rural agency stores, which is a liquor store and a grocery store for any number of years now. It, it hasn't taken us off the moral track, I don't think. So sales numbers for the first couple of months are quite strong. And, um, you know, we're seeing good sales from the uh, in-store concept. That's in South Surrey. It's a BQA store. We know that the top wineries dominate the food stores. We may have a hundred small wineries in there now, but in pretty much any place in the world, it's always boiled down to the big food stores just buying from 
two or three largest wineries. So um, channels like, so the VQA stores will get moved into um, the food stores, the private liquor stores could get bought out, moved into the food stores. Uh, just every channel the small and medium wineries have is gradually being narrowed down. And so much of it seems driven by politics and not policy, which I'm just baffled by. And at the end of the day, I think people just want to have a good wine that's local, available to them in a reasonable way. And I remember the BCWI was lobbying long and hard that uh, with respect to grocery stores, uh, they said it just should be VQA wines. Well, you know what? That represents uh, less than 50% of the British Columbia wineries. Terroir stood up and said it should be anybody that makes wine from 100% BC grown grapes. Government completely understood that. Within a week of our discussing this with Minister Anton, they agreed. And thank you very much for listening, Minister, because honestly, she got the, the rationale. In the wake of these changes, and with some long standing issues still festering, Terroir BC has gained more momentum early in 2015 and bolstered their membership with the addition of more small and medium wineries who feel their interests are not being represented by the BCWI. We've hired an executive director, uh, Karen Graham. Uh, she'll be starting with us uh, Monday, and uh, you know, that's just gonna allow us to do more consistent, open communication with our, not only our members, but you know, anybody who's interested in the uh, BC wine industry. So this is a good move for us, big day for us. Most of the world's younger wine regions require that a minimum of 75% of the wine inside a bottle be produced from grapes grown in that region before its name can appear on the label. In California, the percentage is 100. Cellared in Canada wines have no minimum domestic requirement in BC, however, which means that commercial producers can sell wine made entirely from imported pre-fermented juice and still put the word Canada on the label. Part of the issue is jurisdictional. In British Columbia, the BC Wine Authority was created almost a decade ago to independently administer BC VQA wines, which are made entirely from BC grown grapes. Cellared in Canada is a different category of a wine altogether, and it's primarily imported wine. Uh, and again, it falls outside of our regulatory purview. They don't use our, uh, any of our regulated terms. It's not, it's not BC wine, so it's subject to federal regulation. As the marketing organization for VQA Wines, the BC Wine Institute has the authority to lobby the government for labeling laws more in keeping with world standards. However, the BCWI is not independent, run instead by industry representatives, many of whom work for wineries who produce both VQA and the more profitable Cellared in Canada wines. The Terroir members are kind of mixed on this. Some people would like to see um, one association handle it all. Um, some think that it should, terroir should exist forever and perform that role of representing small and medium wineries and I'd say that's still to be determined but there's so many conflicts of interest with uh, everyone being in the same association that it, it's going to take uh, um, some real political will to keep everyone together I think. That's my hope that we can work through one association but it gets tougher and tougher as they drag out uh, the process of listening to us. The way to, to do that, uh, John is working on it. He's at least got the ear of the government and they understand the problem and they're pushing Terroir and BC Wine Institute to learn how to work together. So it will happen. The essence of the BCWI is to promote uh, the 100% um, you know, BC grown produced and bottled. And um, if they're not promoting that, they're not doing their job. You know, let's grow our brand. Let's protect our brand. If somebody is jaundicing our brand or threatening our brand or undermining our brand by condoning mislabeled or, or improperly labeled international wines, that has to be fixed. What I worry about is when the labeling, and especially because we've got a really young wine consumer out here in BC, and if the labeling gets kind of mixed up where it's like, I know the brand, it looks like it's from Canada, I feel like it's from Canada. I've seen the sign down the road that this, these are a winery and yet, in the end, it's actually grapes from somewhere else. I think that's a disservice to everyone involved. I mean, there's nothing wrong with me bringing in amazing truffles from Italy and doing it as part of my dinner, let's put it that way, but I would never tell them that they were aged and aged at Covert Farms. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just not, I just can't see that being a sustainable way to go, go forward. In what may be a first important step in resolving some of these long-standing issues, the UBC and Kedge schools of business have recently received government funding to study the wine industry in BC and present a neutral, third-party perspective 
on what's best for the BC brand and the wine industry on the whole. That group is going to be looking at uh, two things. One is the issue of cellared in Canada wines and also what is the operating structure uh, for the BC wine industry that would allow it to become recognized on the world stage. This third party neutral environment that is run by very capable people, Roger Sudgeon and uh, Jacques Olivier from, from Kedge, who are going to help us shepherd this industry to a new place. And it should be run, ultimately. The industry should be overseen and run by impartial people. It shouldn't be me, it shouldn't be people that work for Constellation. We need somebody that advocates for the industry, somebody that doesn't undermine the industry. This is a very, very pivotal moment where these petty corporate agendas need to be called out for what they are and the industry has to, has to really be the, the focus of the outcome of this initiative. What's best for the industry? What's best for the province? We're raising the awareness, we're, we're creating some sense of excitement about it, even if at times it's viewed as being disruptive. No, so I think it's, it's been good. Yes, there's lots of changes coming. I think it's a very positive thing that the industry is talking about how can we improve wine in British Columbia? Do we need to change the existing regulatory framework in order to achieve that? Uh, and having those discussions are very positive. Ultimately, many of the decisions in the coming weeks and months may rest with government. And as the profile of Canadian wine on the world stage continues to grow, more attention is being paid to how its image might best be supported and promoted moving forward. I'm incredibly proud of where um, I'm from, which is the Okanagan, and, and I really think that the vineyard owners and the wineries are, are proud of where they're from too. And in my opinion, if grapes are grown in the Okanagan, that should be on the label. If grapes aren't for grown in the Okanagan, there needs to be some clarification of that. So if it's Okanagan growing, put it on there. If it's growing somewhere else and the juice is imported, let's just state it on the label. Where the, where the grape is from, state it and state it clearly. I think that's incredibly important for the future of all the wineries in this, in, in this area. A peaceful summer morning in the Okanagan. The radiant sun and beautiful calm waters aren't particularly notable amid weeks of beautiful weather, but today they're just the calm before the storm. It's finally opening day at the hatch. It's great. That took uh, two and a half years, um, you know, since we bought that property, but just to see uh, the work that the young guys have done, because I basically stayed out of it. They just presented their ideas. I, I let them go and to see the end results, just amazing. It's a really funky, cool winery that actually has really good wine too. It's a fun place to be and it's gonna get more fun. I think the bocce court's opened and by next year we'll be having weddings there and opening up the picnic area. It's a really cool winery. So I've had companies before where you get one or two people that put all the ideas forward and the rest of them are in the box, but this is the toughest for me because I got so many people with ideas that are out of the box. The good news is I like more of those people. And I think that's why you see the hatch. You know, that, that's a perfect uh, outcome of all these people coming together. You know, all the problems we had getting the construction going and even at the end of the day I think the problems that we had might have been a good thing because we were going to build an 8,600 square foot almost four million dollar winery there and, and the hatch um, I think we all draw almost as many people without that level of construction. It's still a very nice nice building and it's drawing a lot of people and it's exceeding all the forecasts and that stuff so maybe it was a good thing. I think it's going to stand out, it's going to be a unique wine experience to the Okanagan, the, the location, the wines, the personalities, the people. I think it's just going to completely stand out from what people are doing here. At Covert Farms, this summer marks 10 years since Gene made his first foray into winemaking. 25th of July we'll be having our 10th anniversary and we'll release our uh, second um, round of the Yodi uh, bubbly, which is a uh, Brut Natural. So we haven't added any dosage wine to it. Um, it's been aging now, what, six years? So it's, uh, it's developing some fantastic character. So we're gonna do a sort of a special release uh, back label for the 10 year. 
Since Derek arrived six years ago, the partnership has fostered an incredible expression of food pairing and sustainable terroir-based production, and the theme for their celebration couldn't be more appropriate. So this weekend is a fun one. It's sort of my little uh, project. Uh, I used to own a barbecue restaurant with my wife, Sunny Reinhold, called Piggy's Barbecue. That's actually where I first met Gene and Shelley. Um, they used to be big fans. They, they liked Anna's food. And we brought the big Friedrich smoker here and, you know, the rustic tables you can see behind us and uh, a lot of the vibe of, of Piggy's. And there was a certain point we thought, well, let's just do what we know. Let's just do a Piggy's Barbecue winemaker's dinner. So this Saturday, we're going to serve everything from collard greens, chicken wings, uh, baked beans, tomato or salads, fresh corn on the cob, all from the farm. I'd like to do a winery event dinner that's not pretentious. We should have over 100 people, so it's quite a big dinner. Um, and for just myself and Gene and Nat, it's going to be, you know, as, as always, a lot to pull off, but a ton of fun. I mean, he's really, he's a really good storyteller. He really brings the passion um, of our farm um, to the public space, and uh, and that's really important. And we're starting to see that sort of coming back to us now. It's not a we're not a hard sell type of you know uh, company or business. At Painted Rock, these vines are also marking a 10th anniversary, and summer is as busy as ever with weddings and events, and a tasting room that seems to be benefiting from the great weather. Lauren's new signs or maybe some recent outstanding reviews. As busy as the first week has been at The Hatch, already bustling with bachelor parties and tour groups, Jesse, Andrew and Micah are ecstatic to be back in their element, connecting with people once again. But amid the chaos, Jason has finally found a little time to get away from it all and decompress from the stress of the last two years. What was once a high pressure career in its own right Music is now, 20 years later, a cathartic break from the hectic pace of life alongside Jesse and Rob. With the music, before it was survival, this one was just a midlife crisis. <laughs> I'm not having an approach. I guess before I put a lot of effort and work into it because it's what you do and it's all you got and now just had some fun. Warm my cold hand I loved you in the sun Summer sweet sights Kissing sunlight At twilight's midnight And you heart. felt so right I loved you in the sun The other thing I did my whole life was, was write songs, and, and you know when you put something together and it just works, yeah. you get that yeah. feeling and it's like really exciting, and you get those little cheesy goosebumps and yeah. stuff, it happens. And for that to happen off doing a winery, it's pretty cool. And part of that grape glass story for us, I, it's amazing to be on this property, you know, we've got 20 acres uh, here. and. Uh, our two house wines, a lot of the grapes uh, for those wines come from right out front here. And so sharing that part of the story, people love because it really connects them to it. This last year, everybody sort of connected. You now it starts as a grape and ends up as you know, a fully packaged bottle of wine ready for sale. And it's been a hell of a lot harder than I ever would have guessed, but even more rewarding than I would have guessed it. Most of the whites from the 2014 vintage have now gone from vine to wine. They've been 18 months in the making, and many of the 2014 reds won't be released for up to another two years. But as we've learned following these three unique ventures through a grape-to-glass story in wine country, the wine industry is filled with overlap, 
and despite the cyclical nature of the seasons, it can be hard to define where the work on one vintage ends and the work on the next one begins. Well, when you sip the wine, you know, I, it, it takes me back and I think about, you know, the whole season that, you know, not just that season actually, because it's, it's the two or three seasons that culminate sort of in that particular year's crop. You know, a couple of hard winters can, you know, cause a couple of years worth of, uh, you know, diminished crops and, you know, and some, you know, culmination of weather and, and such can affect the flavor and, you know, acid balance and, and such. So, you know, you sip it and it helps you reflect on, you know, that's the great, you know, thing about wine and, you know, it's sort of a storing and bottling that sort of essence of a, of a year or two. And, you know, it gives you that time to reflect and, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had a couple good seasons uh, behind us here and another one, or hopefully going forward, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. But after a little time to reflect on 2014, both the year and the vintage may hold some special memories for our three wineries. Tired, but the recession we've had here has been unbelievable. And we still have so many new wines coming down the pipeline and so much other stuff to do that, you know, I kind of start the day tired and walk in here and then, you know, by the time the first group I've poured, four people are beside themselves with excitement and just feeling out the excitement of other people. And it's not hard for me to get re-motivated pretty quickly because all I have to do is just look around and realize that it actually happened and I got to contribute to it. This is going to be a long movie here because we're pretty dedicated to what we're doing here. So. I don't think there's going to be rolling credits anytime soon that we'll be pouring wines and telling stories in here happily for a long time. Really, yeah, really nice ripening with in the 20, 2014 vintage. Uh, our, our flavor profiles are there, and I think we got a really nice balance. So they're aging well in barrel, and I think we're going to have some really, really smart wines in, uh, in the 2014 vintage. 2014, there was a, it's, it's almost a blur in his, in the vineyard to some degree because um, you know we were going through a lot of um, business uh, transitions and, and such and there was a lot of work and a lot of stress that was involved with that and so the to some degree the you know the vineyard was almost a bit of a you know it was actually kind of nice to go out there and relax a little bit and you know just be with the vines rather than you know the paperwork and deadlines and and such so uh, you know, if anything, the vineyard was just kind of my reprieve last year. What, what it'll look back as a turning point in my career, um, with my confidence, there's people in the project that actually believe in me as a winemaker, and there's people around me that I work with that believe in me as a winemaker. I'm being myself more, where before I was just trying to be a winemaker. I make wine, and I am who I am, and uh, for me personally, it's a turning point in my career, for sure. After, you know, having been a cellar hand for a number of years uh, under Kirby, you know, making wine myself. I'm starting to have, you know, enough confidence now that uh, to know where these wines are going to go and how they're going to react. And yeah, and it's, it's exciting. It's a good place. Over the last few years, through the constant overlap and ebb and flow that is winemaking, the overall trend for Canadian wine has been upward and the future is looking very bright. I think that there's tremendous, tremendous unrealized potential in this region and I'm passionate, and, and it, it may take generations of Skinners to figure that out. Or the other families here, let's focus on growing as a team, as an industry, as a province and a country. Let's, let's all, all these things are very, they're very important to me. I think it is making a turn. There's a new generation coming up. There's a lot of energy, and I think it's positive energy. So I think it will, and there's nothing wrong with where we are today. We're very lucky to be in this industry. There's a lot of good people, but I think there's a, a new generation of people coming up that have a lot of exciting things to offer that's gonna add to it. I think there are a few pioneers, like uh, I'm thinking about Jim Wise at Beringal, who's been one of the first people in the Valley growing uh, vinifers, which was very proud at this time. And, and uh, it's uh, that kind of people who've been uh, right from the beginning, looking at what was doing uh, the other, what we were doing the other countries, and to try to uh, find their path in a specific place with a specific weather, with a specific terroir. I think the Okanagan Valley has a kind of a characteristic that there's a huge open-minded place for the people. They want to learn, they want to improve their wines, they want to compete with the best wines in the world. And that's very specific in this place. I've never found this 
anywhere else in the world, uh, even in Bordeaux, where the people are staying on their butts, you know, looking at <laughs> their past instead of looking at the future. I think it's uh, that characteristics which will drive the people in the Okanagan to the best. Next season on Ventures in Wine Country. With 2014's Grape to Glass story complete at Covert Farms, Painted Rock, and Black Swift, the time has come to look for new personalities and new perspectives on Canadian wine. From the hills of Kelowna to the arid benches of the Similkameen, three new stories are waiting to be told, perhaps from a different perspective. Watch this space next year for Ventures in Wine Country, Women in Wine. So I went up the second time with my dad and it was just as the um, frost was beginning to melt and we'd previously contoured all the land and, and everything was nice and smooth and had this nice layer of, of freshly melted mud on top of everything. And we were driving around on my mom's brand new pickup truck that she hadn't even seen yet. And my dad's pointing out, okay, this is where Merlot block is gonna be. This is where the Syrah is gonna go. And just as he's sort of in the middle of, of his big story, the truck gets into a four-wheel slide. We're cascading down the property, heading straight towards the big cliff at the end of the property. It's about the only time my dad has ever turned to me and gone, Lauren, take off your seatbelt. Just would have had a heart attack. I was like, why? He's like, because if this doesn't stop in about three feet, we're going to have to jump out. Want me to jump out of a moving vehicle? Thank goodness the truck stopped right then. I've never seen my dad leap out of anything faster and make one of the guys who was working on the property at the time, who was used to all the big machinery, my dad's a big, big machinery kind of guy, and, and he jumped in and drove the truck off the property. We walked off, to say the least. <laughs> The next time I got up to the property, it was it was all planted with these tiny little vines that my dad was saying were going to be something. But it was it was last time I saw it as as the raw prospect. It was a pretty cool experience to to drive before the slide, and it just looked like endless land. But it was smooth, and and to hear sort of what was going to be in each place was. I, you have to have the vision. My dad had the vision for what it was going to be. It's one of those things that everyone thinks it happens overnight, and and you're starting to get success and everyone's like, oh, you guys are so new, you've, you've come out of nowhere. It's like, no, come out of, of a lot of hard work. My parents have worked extremely hard over the past 10 years to make this what it is. And now with everyone getting to taste the wine and, and the second we were able to release it, everyone was like, this is what you've been working on. Well, this is what that property was over there that we had no idea what it was. You get to really be proud of it when everyone's drinking the wine and they know what effort went into it.